Today we'll be looking at this language, which is the ambiguous CFG problem, which is asking, if we're given a CFG, context-free grammar, I want to figure out whether it's ambiguous or not. So remember, ambiguous means uh, two different, in some sense, different uh, derivations. And by different here, we mean, uh, there are many definitions, but leftmost derivations is one of them. So two different leftmost derivations. So like as an example, if I have this grammar right here, there are two different derivations of the empty string. Either I can go to there directly, or I could uh, go to this variable, uh, sorry, this rule, and have each of the S's go to empty. And so those are two different leftmost derivations, and then therefore this grammar is ambiguous. So we may want to know whether the grammar is ambiguous or not, because there are certain algorithms that run faster on unambiguous uh, grammars. Um, and we may want to figure out whether our grammar is ambiguous, because if it is, then a parser for it may have many different choices it has to make. But if it's unambiguous, it's a lot easier. It turns out that this problem is undecidable. We can't actually figure out whether an arbitrary CFG is ambiguous or not, sadly. And so how does this proof go? Well, the idea is that we want to have two different derivations in that one derivation can make a whole set of strings and the other derivation can have a whole set of strings. And we want to have some kind of intersection between those sets of strings. And that's kind of the idea behind the post correspondence problem. We had all of these tiles and we wanted to have some intersection between all of the strings that can be made in the top row and all of the strings in the bottom row. And we wanted some kind of intersection to occur. So here's the idea. It's actually kind of slick. So uh, let P be uh, a set of tiles, and specifically PCP tiles, and let's uh, call them T1, B1 for top and bottom, and let's say that there are K of them, TK, BK, and then now we got to make a grammar that will be ambiguous exactly when this thing has a solution. Mainly, I can pick some of the tiles such that the top string read one direction equals the bottom string read from the same direction. So here's what the grammar is going to be. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have a starting variable uh, called s, and it's going to make two variables, s1 or s2. And S1 is going to be responsible for making the top row, and the S2 is for responsible for making the bottom row. And it will be, in some sense, ambiguous if there is a choice of a string that can be made with S1 and a string that can be made with S2 that's exactly the same, meaning that the top string equals the bottom string. So uh, one thing that we need to be careful of that though here is that the ambigu ambiguity can really lie anywhere. So what we need to ensure is that S1 and S2 are unambiguous. Because if there's some uh, ambiguity with S1, then uh, that, that uh, won't really help us very much because if there is no match, this will still say ambiguous because there are two different derivations here. So the only ambiguity that I want is with these two variables right here. I don't want any other ambiguity whatsoever. Okay, so, so what are we going to do here? Well, uh, what I want to do is I want to force S1 and S2 to make some string that's exactly the same for both, if and only if there is a match with the original set of tiles. So one approach that you might try is I'm going to have S1 make uh, T1. Uh, it could make T1. It can choose the first tile. And then it might choose some more. And then it could choose TK 
and then some more tiles, or it can just choose uh, a single tile once the recursion is done. So T1 up to TK. Make sure this appears, yeah. So it could be that it just chooses uh, T1 and then S1, and then, so T1, it chooses the first tile. It's allowed to go back through and choose more tiles if it wants to. It's never going to transfer up to back to S or down to S2. So once you picked S1, you're stuck there, which is exactly what we would want. And uh, S2 is going to be very similar, except it's going to be for the bottom row. So B1, S2, up to BK, S2. Uh, so we're stuck in the bottom row in some sense. We're stuck in the S2 variable. And then we have B1 up to BK. We can choose, once the recursion is done, we can select one more uh, tile. Okay, so this sounds like a reasonable approach, but the problem is that suppose that I pick T1 S1 right here and there could be a, and let's say that the grammar is ambiguous, there's nothing forcing me to pick the bottom row right here because the top row, we can have multiple bottom tiles start with the same character. So there's an, and uh, what we would want here is we want them to actually end the same way. So uh, just because uh, they start the same way here uh, doesn't mean that we are picking exactly the same tiles right here. In order to actually guarantee that, we need the ends to be exactly the same in each rule that we apply. So we're going to make a slight modification here. I'm going to do it in pink, where I'm going to introduce new symbols, uh, D1 upstairs up to DK. And what I'm going to do with these guys over here, oops, I didn't select all of it. All right, it's not behaving, so I'm going to punish it. So uh, what I'm introducing here are new symbols that course that are basically marking which of the rules that we actually applied, which tiles we applied, because in principle, we could have the same top string and maybe different bottom strings. So, but the D here is the D values are going to disambiguate which rule we applied, which tile we selected. So the D1s uh, through DK are new symbols, uh, completely new symbols. Or, or you can make them new strings, it honestly doesn't matter. Um, and we're going to do exactly the same idea downstairs. So I'm going to insert D1 right there, DK right there, and uh, make some more room uh, to put D1 there and DK here. So by now enforcing that the ends are exactly the same, now that the, the beginning has to be the same. So notice that S1 is not ambiguous because the ends are, uh, are different. So, uh, in fact, because they're single symbols, you can only apply one of these rules at a time. Okay, so you can only apply uh, one of these rules at a time, and so S1 cannot have any ambiguity whatsoever, and same thing with S2. So the only possible ambiguity is at the top where we can either choose to go left to S1 or right to S2. So there will be, this grammar is ambiguous if and only if there, I should, I should write it this way, if and only if there are some indices, T, uh, I1, uh, let's see, T, I, 2, et cetera, T, yes, T, I, let's say M, let's say I pick M of them. I don't know which ones I selected. So the I sub one here just means it's some T value that was selected. Some of these could be duplicates. And then at the end, we will have uh, the reverse order of these guys. So the, the corresponding D value is gonna be the M one first. So D, I sub M. 
then back up to di1 if and only if that is equal to uh, well the end has to be exactly the same so dim equals di1 because we're assuming that this is ambiguous so that means that the string has to be identical so that means that we selected the exact same indices because uh, the D uh, values were selected in tandem with the D, the T or the B values. So here we're gonna get BI2, BIM for some indices I1 through IM for some indices. And then this is true if and only if, well, if they end exactly the same way and they're the same string, then the beginning has to be exactly the same. So we have ti1 through tim equals bi1 through bim. And this corresponds to a match because we would just select the first of the i1th tile and then etc. up to the imth tile. And then that will give us a match in the in the uh, in the set of tiles. And if there is no set of indices like this, then you can quite easily see that the grammar is not ambiguous. Because if there's no string in common between these two, this is where the only possible ambiguity lies, and so the grammar is unambiguous. Okay, so this was actually a pretty slick proof that sh showing that amb ambiguity or deciding ambiguity for context-free grammars is undecidable using the post correspondence problem and you can prove other problems in a very similar way using post correspondence so hopefully that was interesting leave your thoughts about ambiguous context-free grammars in the in the comments down below as always please like the video and subscribe to the channel it really helps us out there are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further and as always thanks for watching and i'll see you next time